All right, I'm Mike Hartman, one of three co-editors uh, of The Giving Review. The other two co-editors are mentors of mine uh, from the Lyme and Harry Bradley Foundation, where we worked for many years in Milwaukee. Uh, one of those other co-editors is joining us today, Dan Schmidt, who's a longtime mentor uh, of mine from there. Uh, we'll be talking today with Henry Olson, whom we, we know from our uh, experience at, at that grant-making foundation. Uh, Henry, the bio of you will be in the article of which this video is a part, so I'm not going to go into too much uh, depth here. But okay. Henry, a senior fellow of the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C., before which he was at the American Enterprise Institute, before which he was at the Commonwealth Foundation uh, in Pennsylvania. I don't think I skipped any chapters there, Henry. And the Manhattan Institute in New York. And the Manhattan Institute in New York, which would have been between Commonwealth and AEI. I exactly. Believe. Okay. He is also author of, uh, and I have a prop here, Henry, uh, the Working Class Republican, Ronald Reagan, and the Return of Blue Collar Conservatism, available on Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, including now in Kindle format. I see Henry has several copies behind him, uh, which maybe he'll, you know, sign and send to you for a contribution to the Ethics and Public Policy. <laughs> but uh, uh, Henry's also co-author of a book that he wrote prior to that called uh, The Four Faces of the Republican Party. And I think we might be talking about some faces of uh, the party of conservatism and maybe conservative philanthropy uh, in general here. All right, so let's get started then. Henry, you recently did a survey, uh, maybe cooperating with AEI, uh, EPPC and AEI, yeah. uh, and you can tell us about it. But uh, in that survey, you found some distinctions between, uh, the, the survey was of Trump voters in 2020, and you right. found some distinctions between uh, Obama Trump voters and Romney Trump voters. Uh, who'd be considered, I guess, sort of more traditional Republican voters. Uh, so if you can tell us maybe what those distinctions were, uh, and then uh, you can wonder with me slash us what, uh, whether there might be equivalent uh, distinctions to be, drawn, uh, to be drawn among conservative philanthropists or within conservative philanthropy. Yeah, well, thank you very much for this opportunity. Obama Trump voters are people who, uh, voted for Obama, or we made it a little broader, voted for a third party candidate in 2012, who also voted for Donald Trump in 2020. So we're talking about party switchers, by and large. And what we found is that they are substantially more likely to say they are liberal or moderate. Over 50% of Obama Trump 2020 voters say they are liberal or moderate. And as you might expect, that means they are much more favorable to government interaction and subsidy programs than our Romney Trump voters. Although there are some areas such as social security where they curiously have virtually no difference. Uh, but uh, there, even Romney Trump voters are largely supportive of social security and prioritize benefits over taxes in that specific programmatic area. The other area in which they were distinctly different uh, is um, with religion, that uh, over 40% of Obama Trump voters say they are either atheist, agnostic, or have no religion in particular. Uh, fewer than 15%, I believe, of Romney voters said the same thing. And that, again, is the sort of thing we have seen with populist movements around the world, is that people who may identify as Christian in some way, but are neither practicing nor particularly serious about the religion, or in this case, not a practitioner and not a believer at all, are the sort of people who find a populist figure like Donald Trump very, very exciting and does not find somebody who was a more conventional conservative like Mitt Romney the faintest bit interesting. You did not survey the donor class, so I'm asking you to speculate. So no numericization, no, don't, no proof is needed. Do you think there are similar distinctions that could be drawn between a, a conservative donor class? Or are there conservative donors? Is conservative philanthropy speaking to uh, party switchers, I guess, or what, I, what, what in your survey you found to be Obama Trump voters? Historically, uh, conservative philanthropists have not been interested in speaking to these voters, that they tend to be much more conventionally conservative. Uh, if anything, the donor class tends to lean farther in the anti-government direction than the voters within the Republican Party as a whole. So they push in the opposite direction as a whole than 
the Romney, uh, the Obama Trump voters uh, would want. Now, clearly in the age of Trump, there are people who have come to be donors to some form of Trumpism. And uh, what will be interesting is to see whether or not those donors will revert to their pre-Trump interest and be people who will be pushing the Republican coalition more in a small government, low tax direction, or whether they will have seen what Trump brought and say, well, maybe uh, we need to move in a direction that finds the sweet spot between the populist voters who don't like conventional Republican and conservative policies and those who do. And that would be a welcome development for the center-right political movement, because then the philanthropic movement would be helping to fund ideas and research that could become politically useful as opposed to politically harmful. So first, let's look back and then forward, wondering whether you're optimistic about whether that sweet spot can be found. But first, let's look back. How much was conservatism hurt? And then maybe the Trump administration in particular by what had been a lack of interest in looking at that uh, line of thinking, those that set of voters, I don't want to make it too political, but uh, you know, Reagan had a lot of intellectual heft, the term you used in a piece subsequent uh, to him. There were decades worth of philanthropic investments in an infrastructure. Trump did not really have that. I think there was surprise on his part, perhaps others that he won. Uh, how harmful was it that philanthropy had what one might have thought was this blind spot? Well, first, what it did was enable Trump's rise, uh, not solely or, or exclusively, or maybe not even primarily. But what it meant was there were very few people like me. And you know, for your audience, I was an early proponent of the idea of what we can now say is a conservative populist alliance, which is a moderation, not an abandonment of certain trends within American conservatism pre-Trump that I argued were precluding conservatives from communicating with voters who should prefer them to a increasingly progressive dominated Democratic Party, but who were being turned off by Republican stances that on things that they prioritized. Um, so because there was this intellectual blockage at being able to talk in terms and offer policies that these voters would find appealing. We had 17 people who were running, a couple of them were pretty minor, but essentially everyone else offered some flavor of the supply side small government consensus. And Donald Trump was the only person offering what I would have said before was a graphic novel version of what I was talking about. You know, certainly there are many things that Trump said and did that I think were bad politics and are why he lost re-election. But he, a lot of the things he was saying was straight out of what a conservative populist playbook should be. And what that meant was that there was nobody who had the language or the intellectual architecture to respond. Um, then when Trump went into office, there was neither the staffers nor the detailed policy agenda that could be used to build on his intuitions. Where he found it, like in trade with Robert Lighthizer, he was enormously successful because there you had a man who shared his intuitions and had the deep policy knowledge of trade law and negotiation, which allowed him to neither surrender nor um, uh, overreach in the negotiations. But most policy areas, he did not have that. He was surrounded by orthodox Republicans of various stripes. And that contributed to his growing frustration with his aides, because here's a man from business who's used to saying, this is the direction I want to go in and leaves it to his subordinates to build the building or to you know, do the project. And you find out that none of the people even understand what the project is or care about the project or maybe even actively oppose the project. So um, it was enormously damaging to the Trump administration in practice, and it was enormously damaging to the Republican Party because it meant that a more politically experienced candidate could not speak in the terms that the voters wanted to hear. And hence, we now have the Trump phenomena, and it was entirely avoidable. Yeah. Okay, then 
you know, before we get to the future potential sweet spot, one more question for fun. You know, before we started recording this conversation, the three of us were recalling sitting in a bar, uh, we think on Amelia Island at a conference in what would have been, Henry, you're probably going to remember, 2015, maybe 2012. It was after the Romney election. It was November of 2012. So you were contemplating the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, What were we talking about then? Uh, If you can recall, summarize, uh, it might be what you just said. But uh, what did what drinks did Dan order for us? And, and if you recall what we discussed, uh, why don't you summarize that? Well, I don't know what drinks Dan ordered, but I almost always have uh, scotch neat. So I'm going to go with that for me. Okay. Um, you are correct, sir. <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But um, and you know, what we were talking to- about was what had just happened. You know, I was, you know, going back to 2012, I also do election analysis and prediction. I predicted in the uh, National Review Online the day before the election that Romney would lose. This was at a time when virtually every single Republican operative said not only that he would win, but that he would win by a not close margin, as Michael Barone, who's an idol of mine and an excellent uh, cephologist, wrote in the Wall Street Journal that the fundamentals suggested a four to five point win and a sweep of the swing states. Well, the opposite happened. And I had actually called it right. I only missed one state, Florida, which was the closest state in the election uh, with respect to popular vote margin. And so we were talking about that. And you know, I had talked about uh, the need to reach out to blue collar voters for about three years at that point, written many articles on it. I know you all had read many of those articles. I talked about um, It's a Wonderful Life and how the essential problem of the Republican Party and Mitt Romney in particular is that they allow themselves to be characterized as Mr. Potter when in fact Americans want to be governed by George Bailey. And we talked about a project at the time, I was calling it the Center for American Renewal or CARE, C-A-R-E, that would go uh, directly at what would that uh, look like. And of course, Reagan and what became the book was part of that, but it was a broader idea that involved the sort of systematic policy review and work that had it been done would have helped prepare the way for a more responsible alternative uh, and certainly would have, if there was no responsible alternative willing to run with it, certainly would have uh, been able to partially inform the Trump administration. Great, why don't we finish with part one there and then pick up the story uh, with what you were presaging uh, that occurred later with, uh, in part two next.